And there are a lot of counterfeit religions and cults that um, are passing themselves off as orthodox. Essentially, the, the main claim of this group is that African Americans who came over through the transatlantic slave trade are actually the descendants of the ancient Israelites. Uh, there's a growing presence of the he Hebrew Israelite uh, churches and traditions that we've really seen aligned with the sort of rise of Trump mm -hmm. and this resurgence with white supremacists in, uh, in the United States, this movement to want to go back to the way mm -hmm. things were. <laughs> Hello, I'm Kevin Cosby, president of Simmons College of Kentucky, the official school of the National Baptist Convention of America International. Welcome again to Torch. And uh, you will be glad that uh, you have tuned in to today's podcast. In fact, you might want to uh, contact someone else uh, that you know who is interested in the important theological issues that we're facing today in the black church and uh, what are some of the threats to Orthodox Christianity um, in the black church? Because we have with us today two men who are outstanding scholars. One of them is our own provost, uh, Dr. Lewis Brogdon, mm -hmm. a PhD, uh, who is just absolutely brilliant and a prolific writer. Uh, in fact, uh, you might want to get some of his books and we will uh, put those uh, officially online for you so you can find out more about them. But this wonderful book on Philemon, this book here that Dr. Brockton has written, uh, Hope on the Brink, which is uh, dealing with nihilism and hopelessness, is one of the best books that I have ever written, re excuse, ever read. He wrote the book. I, uh, but it's a great book, uh, Hope on the Brink. And uh, here's the third book by Dr. Brock that just keeps cranking them out. <laughs> Can anybody stop the pain? Well, not only were these books, are these books good for your reading and you can use them in Sunday school classes and in your sermons, but these are the great, a great source for small, small group studies. They're relevant topics, news you can use, and just, just the good information. My God, it just keeps writing. And these are scholarly works, Dying to Lead, and this deals with the issue of suicide and depression mm -hmm. among clergy and caregivers. And then Dr. Brogdon has written this book, The New Pentecostal Message, and uh, this deals with the prosperity movements, mm -hmm. uh, the pros and cons of it. And uh, thank you for this, Dr. Brogdon. And then here's a book on preaching, The Spirituality of Black Preaching. These are scholarly works and we're thankful. I know the National Baptist Convention of America is thankful not only to have Simmons, but to have such uh, reputable scholars who are pouring into us and training those who will give leadership in our churches at Simmons College of Kentucky. So welcome, Dr. Lewis Brockton, provost, provost at Simmons College of Kentucky. And also, right beside me is a, a young man who, and I want to congratulate him, uh, Jimmy Butts who will be graduating from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary in May. So next month, uh, he graduates, yes, and uh, he will be joining the faculty at Simmons College of Kentucky. I am excited to have him on the faculty at Simmons, uh, first of all, because he's a brilliant scholar. He has his master's, he will have his master's of divinity degree uh, with an, an emphasis on Islamic studies. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, with a specialization 
on El Haj Malik El Shabazz, whom we know as Malcolm X. And, uh, you know, they tell, bikers tell us that the way that you learn about counterfeit money uh, is by not studying counterfeit money, but by studying the real thing. And as a result of studying the real thing, you'll know a lot about counterfeit money. And there are a lot of counterfeit religions and cults that um, are passing themselves off as orthodox. Mm. And uh, Dr. Butts is able to address these issues and to help enlighten us and educate us about the cults and alternative religions uh, that, I've, um, that are capturing the imagination of especially millennials. When I was in seminary, we talked about the traditional cults like the Jehovah Witnesses uh, and the Mormons mm -hmm. and Sun Young Moon, uh, the Moonies and, and New Age and Crystals and mm -hmm. uh, uh, all these type of non-alternative religions, but those were primarily in the white church. Mm -hmm. We have a new group of, re of alternative religions in the black community mm -hmm. that is appealing to the sensibilities of black millennials that black pastors need to know about. And we're so happy to have Ed Simmons College and for today's podcast, a man who can help us ferret out these various uh, belief systems. Uh, first of all, Jimmy, welcome. Welcome to Simmons. Yes, sir. Congratulations about graduating from my alma mater, Southern Baptist Seminary. Yes, sir. And uh, for being on the uh, faculty at Simmons College. We are excited about you. Amen. Thank you. Tell us something about yourself. Uh, so right now I am uh, one of the pastors at Forest Baptist Church. Uh, my focus is on discipleship. Uh, my aim is to try to equip Christians to uh, live out the gospel in their lives, uh, but also be prepared to engage with these particular religious groups. And so uh, I'm originally from Virginia, uh, transported to uh, Cincinnati, and then I came down to Louisville to finish off my degree at seminary. I did not know that Southern had a Master's of Divinity degree with a concentration in a particular area. I just thought Masters of Divinity was kind of a, a, just the degree, and I didn't know that they had specialization. Tell us something about that. Yeah, so uh, I don't know how exactly how long ago they, they did this or they began this, but you can focus on many different emphases. So as you've already noted, Islamic studies is my emphasis, but you can also focus on biblical and theological studies. Uh, pastoral studies, evangelism, and things like that. And so essentially, uh, you will dedicate about 18 hours wow. of your degree program to that particular emphasis. That, that is wonderful. That is wonderful. So, uh, alternative religions in the black context. Yes. It's not, it's not uh, the Mormons. Mm -mm. It's not <laughs> Jehovah Witnesses. Mm -mm. You kind of feel sorry for the Jehovah Witnesses now, don't you? <laughs> They've been eclipsed by other other groups. So yes. tell me, what are the, you know, here in Louisville, and I'm sure the other pastors of the National Baptist Convention of America have seen these groups of black men who are rooted in Old Testament culture and tradition. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, uh, it's called the Hebrew, what is it? The Hebrew Israelites, yes sir. Hebrew Israelites, the mm -hmm. Hebrew Israelites. Mm -hmm. Most people don't know that when Martha King's mother was shot mm -hmm. from her playing the Lord's Prayer at the Ebenezer Baptist Church, Yes. She was shot mm -hmm. by a person, I think, of the Hebrew Israelite mm -hmm. tradition, yes. mm -hmm. who came from, who's from Kentucky. And they had a cult there in Winchester, Kentucky, right here in the state of Kentucky. Wow. Yeah. And wow. Uh, so most people don't realize that. We know about James Earl Ray, who mm -hmm. assassinated Martin Luther King, but his mother was also assassinated. In fact, two black people tried to wipe out the King family. One, a deranged woman in New York who stabbed yeah. Dr. King mm -hmm. while he was signing autographs in the early 60s, and then, of course, Dr. King's mother was assassinated, shot down uh, by a Hebrew Israelite. Tell us, what is, what are, what is the Hebrew Israelites about? Yeah, so uh, if, if anyone uh, knows anything about black or, or African-American Christian theology, you know there's an emphasis on the, the motif of the Exodus story. And so uh, as uh, enslaved Africans were engaging with uh, the scriptures in the Old Testament, 
Uh, they were looking at the stories of Moses and uh, how the Lord was delivering them uh, from slavery. And so they, they identified with that. Uh, and so you, you see songs in our, even in our spirituals that uh, highlight and emphasize certain things uh, about the Exodus story. But also we even call people like Harriet Tubman, like the black Moses. Right. And so uh, there, there are many things within traditional African-American theology that emphasizes uh, the Exodus story and the children of Israel and slavery. And so what happened is that as, as time went on, uh, as African-Americans, and I, I think rightly, were identifying with uh, the children of Israel and, and recognizing that God was a God of liberation, mm -hmm. that he could deliver them from uh, their, their bondage, uh, eventually there came a strand of, of certain black people who became or who, who began suggesting that not only is this just a figurative identification that we have with the Israelites, but there's actually a literal identification that we have with the Israelites. So we're actually the real uh, Israelites. And so uh, essentially the the main claim of this group is that African Americans who came over through the transatlantic slave trade are actually the descendants of the ancient Israelites. Wow. So uh, Elijah Muhammad said we are the the lost but now found tribe of Shabazz. Of mm -hmm. Shabazz. Mm -hmm. So basically they're doing the same thing in their own way yes. that the nation of Islam. How do they make the connection you know that historically we are sub-Sahara mm -hmm. in terms of, uh, of um, our uh, kidnapping mm -hmm. from Africa. We are sub-Saharan. Yes. And the uh, Hebrew people are above the Sahara. So how, how do they make that connection? Yeah, yeah. So, so first let me back up for a minute just to say that um, what, what I'm suggesting here is, is not that the ancient Israelites did not have dark skin and did not have African blood right. in their genetic makeup. I actually believe that. But the question that I'm addressing is more so, do we as African Americans actually descend from them? And as you said, uh, there were, there, there is historical documentation of uh, Israelites uh, who scattered during, during their diaspora within to North Africa. But then you also have people who point to the Falashas of Ethiopia, uh, who are a, a Jewish, uh, they, they, do, they are African black skinned people who practice Judaism, and they point to them as uh, validation for their claims. Okay. And so, and, and the Falashas, they would point to the connection with uh, the Queen of Sheba and Solomon and say that this is where that connection comes from. This is, this is how the royal line of, 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 uh, of Solomon was mixed with African, you know, Ethiopian blood. So, so therefore, since we are a Hebraic people, mm -hmm. then that means that culturally speaking, we should act like Jews and practice all the feast days, the, 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 the dietary laws, and. The whole thing, right? Exactly. So, yeah, so it's, it's interesting because they point to Deuteronomy chapter 28 uh, as a means of reconciling wow. our black people. Blessings we and curses. People, the yeah, blessings condition and curses, that we're right. in. And they say that if, if you look at the condition of our people here in the Americas and you look at the curses that are announced in uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, no other people. Uh, fits that description more than we do. And so the reason that we are receiving these curses is because we have refused as a people to obey those Mosaic laws that you, that you right, mentioned. Right, so the, the, the blessings and curses. So that would mean that God then is complicit mm. in, in that God is complicit in white supremacy and black oppression. Um, I don't know if they would uh, articulate it that way. I think they would point to personal responsibility more. They would say that God has a standard that he uh, placed on his people and he warned them time and time after again uh, that these curses would fall on them 
And so uh, since we uh, are not, since we live the way that we live, so they would point to what they would call uh, like the decadent culture uh, of African Americans um, and say like, look, look, look how we live. This is the reason why we are receiving the judgments of God. And so, yeah, wow. so they would say so they would more so uh, highlight uh, personal responsibility rather than uh, putting it on God. They would say that God is using, just like in the Old Testament, God used heathen nations to chastise the Israelites. They would say that that's the same thing that's going on uh, with, with us here. What's up, everybody? This is Jason Claiborne, and this is The Mix, and we want to give you the best for your worship services, your choirs, your praise team, and your music department. Whether you have a small church or you have a mega church, it's all for everybody, and that's what this mix, Music and Excellence, is about. Just to tell you a little bit about myself, I've been the worship leader here at St. Stephen Church for almost 15 years, started young in this, and God has blessed me to write for a lot of amazing artists such as Hezekiah Walker, Better, You're All I Need, uh, Bashan Mitchell over and over, I Worship You, Ricky Dillard, I Survived It, so I kind of know a little bit about what's going on, and then our pastor, he switches and changes his vibe, so you have to be well versed in your hymns and, and um you know, even some little secular songs, you know, that can be used during um, your worship services for uh, your sermons or whatever like that. You know, it's very important that you are uh, you, you, you learn music for your church in its totality. And so I am so excited about being here on the mix to talk to you. And this week. We're going to give you three things that you need to look for when you're looking for worship leaders and praise team members. You have to understand that it's not the same as being in a choir. There are a lot of choir singers, but uh, there's, there's particular um, things that you look for when you're looking for a Levite. Uh, and those are the people that, as you know, are in the front line, get called on first, go out before the war, before the battle, before the sermon, all of that good stuff. We lead the people, get the people ready and uh, their hearts soften, softened uh, to be able to receive the word of God. So briefly, let's look at three things that will help you in preparation of building a praise team, looking for a worship leader. Really, we can do a whole nother segment on looking for worship leaders um, because there's different things that you need to know about that. But let's go to the praise team. Let's start with that. The praise team, there's three things that you have to look for. First thing, well, we'll start three and then go down. Three would be vocal ability. There's a different um, uh, look and sound that you're looking for on a praise team. Uh, um, there's a there's those persons that kind of stand out in your choir that pick up quick on music and uh, 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 have good stage presence um, uh, that know their notes. Not only knows their notes, but knows the tenor, alto, and soprano note. Um, uh, and, and those are the type of singers that you want to be on your praise team uh, that have the vocal ability, uh, that can retain, uh, and that can hold their part on their own. It's very important uh, for, uh, as far as vocal ability is for them to be able to sing and not ne necessarily what we call be a next to. Um, uh, there's a lot of people in choirs that, you know, feel like they can be on praise teams and your praise team does not necessarily have to be large. If you have three people that have the vocal ability to be able to hold the soprano tenor and alto part, you can use them on your praise team uh, and, and pick some worship songs, some variety uh, uh, that they can sing. Um, number two, uh, and I know this is tech week and we're talking about different things, with, uh, different software, and this is a big part of it, which is mic control. Now I know this has a lot to do with your audio uh, ministry and, and them doing sound check and being able to uh, uh, balance the vocal, the sounds, but it's also um, uh, the person that's holding the mic, having mic control and being able to keep that mic in front of you, uh, sing with authority, use that hand. The other hand is not just supposed to be a, a hand that's just to your side, but being able to use it to minister and, 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 and being able to, there's a lot of things that you're doing when you're leading 
doing worship. You know, you're not just standing there moving from side to side. You know, it's engaging the crowd and bringing them into the song. Even if they don't know the song, it's the can the person relate and uh, relay the song uh, that brings them into the worship experience. Mic control is very important. You know, there's certain parts of the song where it gets loud. You got to be able to pull it back a little bit. You know, and when those parts of the song that are soft and kind of uh, grabbing the people's attention, you, you got to be able to understand and keep that mic in front of you, not be afraid of it. And those are the type of singers that you that you want on your praise team, not being afraid to grab that mic and go for it and, and, and be a part uh, as a Levite. Number one. I, and I said this earlier with three but vocal ability, but it's really the number one thing. It's being able to retain. Being able to retain songs, pick up quick, uh, being able to learn something the day of, <laughs> you know, um, we, we are the own call team. So when the choirs can't sing, um, uh, when, when somebody needs to fill in to lead worship on a Sunday, you know, you have to have the type of people that have the availability to be able to be there for worship and be on call. So retaining songs, learning quick uh, and, and, and being able to produce quickly. That's what praise team members are. That's what you need to look for when you look for in praise and worship teams and, and people that you put on your worship teams. It's nothing against those that are in choirs. And, 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 you know, I know a lot of choir members. I've had a lot of choir members that wanted to be a part of the praise team. And, you know, uh, it, you, you ha almost have to put your feelings aside because it's about excellence in ministry that's what we're doing ministry and excellence so you know you have to let them know hey look you're a choir singer um and uh, you might have a choir singer that's a leader that leads songs but not necessarily is a praise team member so you have to have um that those type of singers those are the three things this week that we want to share with you mic control vocal ability and being able to retain and keep songs and learn on the spot um, because you never know, you know, you could get the pastor could be up and say, I want you to do this for invitation. You have to go in the back, get the singers together, learn it and be able to perform and produce. That's the type of singers that you need. That's what you need. Uh, it, it's almost it's, it's almost a tear right up under a artist. You know, you got to have those singers that are, are ready to go, can learn, that also have good attitudes, that also are, um, are, are have the heart of worship. And that's very, very important in being on a praise team. Uh, you don't want to look behind you and see a whole bunch of people with, you know, sour faces or upset. But you, you, you have to understand that being a Levite and being out in front, you go before, you go before the army. You get, you prepare the way. You make everything ready. You get them ready. You get them ready uh, to receive the word of God. And that's an important part on being on praise teams. This is Jason Claiborne. I love you with the love of the Lord. Simmons College of Kentucky. And this is Music in Excellence. Dr. Brown, you have anything you want to ask him, or how do you how would you respond to this? Well, I I mean, I think we've really seen an, an uptick. Uh, uh, there's a growing presence of the he Hebrew Israelite uh, churches and traditions that we've really seen aligned with the sort of rise of Trump mm -hmm. and this resurgence with white supremacists in, uh, in the United States. This movement to want to go back to the way mm -hmm. things were. <laughs> And because Christianity, Western Christianity, is so de-Africanized, mm. you know, we really try to separate Africa, uh, which had a major presence in early Christianity, and make Christianity this Western tradition built upon, in the American context, genocide and slavery. Mm -hmm. It then feeds this narrative uh, that that fits, you know, this movement to take America back to the way it was. Mm. And now you're starting to have brown skinned, dark skinned people saying, man, I got some questions about this Christianity piece, mm. that it, that there's a disconnect with Africa. And I think one of the reasons we're seeing more people really interested in this, and their, their numbers are starting to grow, 
-hmm. and they're you know out the closet really challenging our churches about our African heritage mm -hmm. um, so that I think we do have some theological work to do because mm -hmm. there's a theological component uh, connected to biblical texts and the emergence you know the whole Judaism early Christianity link but there's a deeper cultural piece to this mm -hmm. um, that Millennials are interested in something uh, that has that cultural, that ethnic component. So when you take millennials, you're talking about 18 to 34. Mm -hmm. So that is that their target demographic, would you say? Mm -hmm. 18 to 34. Yeah, and, it, and, it's, and, it's, 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 and I think it's really, really interesting that what the Hebrew Israelites will play on is the cultural piece, mm -hmm. you know, and not the biblical and the theological mm -hmm. where you know, it, it's just really hard to argue for any kind of theology that's going to say, you know, you've got a select group of people, they are the elect and other people, they're on the outside looking in. Uh, I, I think history shows us what happens with any form of theology that does that, even if you're a minority group uh, pushing that. But nevertheless, it, it, there's, there's appeal. I talk to pastors all over the country who leaders in the Hebrew Israelite tradition are challenging them to debates in their churches mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, about these things and, and to be honest maybe some of you pastors at home uh, mm -hmm. there's someone in your community who, who you know and who's challenging you mm -hmm. and you kinda man you don't know what to do about that you know you you need to engage leaders They're very confrontational yes, yes. yeah very confrontational yeah you need to engage leaders who have studied this and to be able to enter into the conversation, I think in a non-defensive way. It, right. can, it can be ver very, very helpful to, to hear them out uh, and then to find some ways to kind of engage them because they're saying something that's connecting with... Dr. With Brian, what is, a, what is apologetics? Uh, apologetics is just, you know, one definition of it is giving a defense of the faith. A defense of the faith. Yeah. Okay. You know, but I think... Sometimes apologetics, it always has this sort of defensive posture, mm -hmm. when really apologetics can also have a dialogical, mm -hmm. constructive component to it, where people believe things for a variety of different reasons, cultural, social, deeply mm -hmm. personal. Uh, and what I like about the conversation we're having is, is we're really showing how to have nuanced conversations about you know, various religious traditions. Because one of the reasons more younger African Americans are drawn to these movements is because, you know, we've de-Africanized our faith. Right. You know, we've bought into this sort of white West, and you can go in black churches with white Jesus is all <laughs> over the wall, mm -hmm. uh, white depictions of God, white depictions of angels, going to movies based on quote unquote the Bible, and mm -hmm. everybody in the movie who is a of note is white and then of course the so, so churches and pastors that say all oh, this it's unimportant yeah. mm. they play right into the hands yep. yes. of the Hebrew Israelites yep. because race to quote Cornell West race matters yes yes, yes. race race matters yes uh, what about an apologetics how, how do we and first of all why it's important that pastors engage in, in apologetics be trained Theologically in apologetics. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And let, let me uh, just piggybacking off of, of something that he said as well. Uh, one of the scriptures that that um, stands out to me is in Deuteronomy. I think it's chapter twenty-five, where uh, the children of Israel they were. I think Moses was recounting the story of them leaving out uh, from the Exodus, so they were being liberated. But then he also pointed to I think it was the people, the Amalekites who came around their rear yeah. and was attacking the, the weak people who were straggling right. uh, in, in the back. And so one yeah. of the things that I want to point out to this to many of our uh, black pastors is that I think uh, we may be so focused on liberation, which I think is important. That, 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 that we're walking into liberation and fighting against white supremacy. We're so preoccupied with fighting against white supremacy, which I think is a legitimate fight, but we need to make sure that we keep our eyes on the, on, on the tail end of our congregation as well, who's being swallowed up by these particular groups. Wow. And so I think that's one of the main things that I would want to say is that, yes, yeah, stay in the fight against you know, white supremacy, 
but also understand that um, these groups, as, as, as my brother here pointed out, they oftentimes ride on the wave of white supremacy. Right. Yes, they yes. do. They, they ride right on Absolutely. in on the wave of white supremacy. Yep. And while we're battling against that and looking for our liberation from that, which because it is a, uh, a, a very uh, you know, taxing fight cause, 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 because the, the power is so, uh, so great. If you could give me some apologetics. Yes, sir. Uh, more of a catechismic, catechism type of apologetics where this is what they believe, here's your defense. If there were about three or four things, this is what uh, they believe uh, that we are cursed. Mm -hmm. That's the first point Hebrew Israelites believe. That black people, well first of all, black people are the original mm -hmm. Hebrew people. Yes. That we our lineage mm -hmm. can be traced back to Moses, mm -hmm. J Jacob, mm -hmm. the Hebrew people. Yep. Lineage. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so not even color, but lineage. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's the first point, right? Mm -hmm. What's your apologetic? How, what would you, how would you respond to that? Yeah, so uh, first I would say that uh, when we look at where some of the legitimate cases of Israelites are in Africa, so, so there is a tribe in Africa called the Limba tribe uh, who, you know, stud genetic studies have actually been done and it's been verified that they actually descend from the Israelites and they're b just as black as me and you. Mm -hmm. uh, but we all don't come from the Limba tribe. Right. So it's legitimate for the Limba, uh, but it's not, that doesn't necessarily mean it's legitimate for us. And so I would just argue that, um, because the way that the argument goes for, for the Hebrew Israelites is that when they went over to Africa, I'm talking about the Europeans, and they snatched the Africans from their homeland, that somehow or another they were able to just get the Israelites. Uh, and, and, and that argumentation in and of itself should seem a little bit suspicious anyway from the jump that it's saying that this out of randomly grabbing Africans to enslave them, the only ones that made it over here were actually the true Israelites. Okay. But then we also know as well that, um, that the Africans that were brought here, although we look at ourselves as one people now, uh, there were many different right. tribes and, and ethnic groups yes. of Africans who Correct. came here. Good point. And so good the point. idea that you can look at a random African American and just say that you are an Israelite. And what's interesting, if we could do, you know, they have uh, Ancestry.com yes. mm -hmm. where you can actually trace your lineage. Yes. And, and if you do, I, I can assure you yeah. that you have so, you, 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 you're, we're such a mixed group. Yes. That I, I probably have traces of, of British and, yeah. mm -hmm. and French and, and all these type of other, <laughs> yeah. you know. And, 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 and race is such an artificial construct yes. anyway. It's mm -hmm. a political construct mm -hmm. which has no, no ontological reality. Yeah.